In this video, what we're going to do is learn about the SQL utilities that are provided in the Polars package for data analysis in Python. Now, we recently did an intro video on Polars, and in that video, we explored the basics of how to use the package for data analysis. We're going to dive deeper in this video and explore the SQL utilities in Polars, and we're going to use a real life data set to do that. Now, before we get started, I want to thank everyone that donated to this coffee campaign. We have met the goal and I'm going to release this Django Risk Framework series on YouTube. If you want to support the channel, the link is in the description. Let's get started and dive in. Now I'm on the Polar's user guide here and we're going to go to this section on SQL. And when we click that, we have a drop down. We can go to the introduction. Now Polar's supports interaction with SQL, although it also says here it's recommended that users do familiarize themselves with the normal Polar's expression syntax as well as knowing how to do the SQL queries. Now, for a lot of people, they might prefer to use SQL because it's more familiar to them. So if you're not a Python data scientist or software engineer, you might be more familiar with SQL. For example, if you're a data analyst or a data engineer, Polars offers the support and that brings the package to a wider audience than it would otherwise. And it also makes it familiar to people that have worked with things like PySpark. So if you've used Spark before, there are ways of interacting with these data frames using SQL. So Polars has similarities and that's a benefit over, for example, using Pandas. Now, one thing to note here, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so we can see it. There is no separate SQL engine because Polars is going to translate these SQL queries into the native expressions and they are then executed using its own engine. So that's just a note here. Polars doesn't have an SQL engine built in, but it is able to translate SQL queries into expressions. Now, before we start writing the code, I'm going to introduce the data set. And this is a data set I've grabbed from Kaggle. There's a link to this in the description. It's for employee data. So it's kind of similar to the data we worked with in the introduction to Polars video. And you can download that data set as a CSV file using this link here. Now I've already done that. And if we go to the directory here, I've got a Jupyter notebook for this video called Polars SQL. And we have an employee.csv file as well. If we double click that, we can look at the data and you can see the fields here. For example, first name, gender, start date, and so on. We're gonna use this file now and we're gonna read it in using Polars. Now I'm using Polars on Jupyter notebook and we're using Python 3.12 in this video. We've imported Polars as PL. And we're going to use a top level function called read CSV. And the file name that we're going to pass in here is employees.csv. And we're going to store the result of calling that function in a variable called df for data frame. Now, once we read the file in, I'm going to call data frame.head and we're going to have a look at the top five rows of that data. And you can see all the columns in the data set. And each of these columns has a data type. We saw some of that in the last video, so we're gonna move on now. Now, before we do move on, note that Polars also has a lazy API. So there's a function called scan CSV. And when we execute this, we get back some different output here. We actually get back a plan, a query plan here. And if we go to the documentation for the scan CSV function, it's gonna lazily read in from a CSV file or from multiple files via the patterns that you provide. Now, if you're interested on a video on the lazy API in Polos, let me know in the comments. And this lazy concept, for example, using lazy frames instead of normal data frames, they give Polars the ability to do some really cool things such as reading larger than memory files into data frames. So if you're interested in a video about that, let me know in the comments. We're going to see some of the concepts from this in this particular video as well. So let's change this back to read CSV and we can look at the head of the data frame. Now we have this data frame. We saw in the introductory video how to perform aggregations, for example, to group by specific columns and aggregate values. Let's add a new cell just below here. And what I'm going to do is look at the data frame and we're going to use the group by function that we saw in the last video. And we're going to group by the team column. And if we look at the team column above here, that contains the particular department that the employee is in, for example, marketing or finance. So we're going to group by that column and then we can perform aggregations on the groups that come back from that column. So what I'm gonna do is look at the salary column for each team. So we can use pl.call and we're passing the salary column. And then the aggregation function is gonna be the mean function. And what that's gonna give us back here is an average. So for each distinct team in the data frame, we're gonna get back the average salary for that team. So for example, you can see the teams on the left-hand side and we get back the average salary across all employees in that team in this column here. 
Now what we're going to do is learn how to perform this query using the SQL API in Polars and that API is going to allow us to perform some similar aggregations. So let's go to the documentation for the Python API for the SQL interface. Now there are four primary entry points and each of these operates at a different level of granularity. So for example we have an SQL context object as well as a top level polars.sql function. And these operate on what's called the global context. And we also have frame level functions such as dataframe.sql and lazyframe.sql methods, as well as finally this one here, polars.sql expression. And that's a function that can create native polars expressions from SQL. We're going to explore most of these in this video. And what we're going to do to start with is look at the dataframe.sql function. So I'm going to go back to the Jupyter Notebook. We have a data frame here called df. Let's go to the cell below here and again we'll look at the data frame's head and we can perform some queries using the SQL interface. Now let's say we wanted to select the salary from this data frame and get back only that column. What we can do is use the dataframe.sql method and we can pass an SQL expression in here. So select salary from self and the self in this case refers to the data frame to which this query is being applied. When we execute that, we get back the salary column as you can see here. And we can perform additional operations, for example, filtering here. So we might want to get back only the records where the salary is greater than 140,000 as one example. When we execute that query, you can see the salary column here is returning only the records with greater than that value. And if we select all here, we get the entire data frame, but only for each row with a salary greater than 140,000. So you can see how easy it is to perform SQL queries on a Polar's data frame using the dataframe.sql method. And we we'll use self to refer to that data frame. Now we can also use other SQL keywords. So what I'm going to do is go back to the original query, select salary from self, and we can use the limit keyword to get back a subset of the rows. So for example, if we want to limit that to five results, we get back these salaries. And we can also use expressions in the select statement to create new columns. For example, if we divide the salary by 12, we can then alias that as monthly. And when we execute this query, we can see we get back the salary on the left hand side, but we now have a new column called monthly. And that gives us the monthly income for that employee. And we've done that by using this expression here. We're taking the salary, dividing it by 12, and we create an alias here and call the resulting column monthly. So if you're already familiar with SQL, this gives you a very nice interface where you can query the data, perform filtering, and also create new columns in the data set just by using SQL expressions. And we can perform all sorts of queries here. For example, we could take the average salary from the data frame, and that's gonna give us back the average salary, as you can see below, across all of the records in this data frame. Now at this point, what I want to do is go back up here, and I want to replicate this query where we're grouping by the team column. And for each team group, we are aggregating the salary and getting the average salary. So let's see how to do that just now. We've got the average salary across the entire data frame. But what we want to do is we want to actually group here. So we're going to use the SQL group by statement and we're going to group by the team column. And I want to grab the team for each grouping here and get that back in the selection as well. So let's execute this query. And you can see we've got engineering here and the average salary across all the records that have engineering in the team. Now the question is, does this match the output that we got earlier on? So if we go back to the top here, you can see different records. It's a different ordering, I think. But for example, we've got engineering here and that has a value of 94,269. If we go down here, you can see it's the same value in this data frame. Now we can get this in a specific order. For example, if we want to have the teams alphabetical here, we can order by that column. So order by team. And you can see it's going from business development to client services and that particular column in the results is now in alphabetical order. Now we can also execute queries and polars against data frames in the global namespace. So what does that mean? What I'm going to do is rather than refer to df.sql, we're going to refer to the polars.sql method. And what we do here is replace self with the name of the data frame that we want to query against. Now the variable is called df, so we're going to change that to df here. When we execute that query, we get back a slightly different result. And like we saw earlier on with the scan CSV function, this has given back a query plan. And the reason for that is that the polars.sql method is going to execute this using the lazy API. And what we need to do in order to get back the results is call the dot collect method. And that's going to give us back the same data frame that we saw before. So the difference here, data frame.sql, when you execute that with an SQL query, it's going to give you back the data frame. But the polars.sql function, that's going to execute in lazy mode. And in order to get the results, we either call the dot collect method 
or one alternative is we can pass a query parameter called eager and set that to true and that's going to give us back the results as well. Now why might you want to use polars.sql? Well you might be joining up different data frames so when you use the top level pl.sql function you can refer to the names of these data frames within your statement as opposed to using dataframe.sql and just referencing the self data frame. Now to expand a little bit on this, I'm going to go to the documentation. So SQL queries are always executed in lazy mode and that allows pollers to take advantage of the full set of query planning optimizations. And when you execute in lazy mode, you need to collect the results either by setting eager to true or by explicitly collecting the result using the collect method. Now this is using the SQL context. We're going to see a bit more about that later in the video, but you can pass these eager equals true parameters to the SQL context as well. And that means that any queries that you then execute are going to be executed not in lazy mode and they're going to return the data frame. Now let's go back to the Jupyter notebook. What I want to do here is execute one last query. We want to get back the rows here with the average salary for each team. But we want to use the having clause in SQL to get back only the rows that have a salary greater than a particular number. So what I'm going to do to start with is I'm going to break this into a multi-line string here in Python. And what we can do is use the triple quotes in order to do that. And let's format the SQL query a little bit better. So we're going to put the statements on new lines here. And that's quite common in SQL queries. So we're selecting the team and the average salary for the team from the data frame. And we're grouping by the team and ordering by the team in the results. What we're going to add now to this is the having clause. And look at the salaries here in this column. These are the average salaries for each department. But I want to get back only the averages that are greater than 90,000. So when we want to perform this filtering based on the aggregated data, we can use a having clause in SQL. So I'm going to add the having clause here and let's say when the salary is greater than 90,000. When we execute this query, we get back the results below here. All of these salaries are now greater than 90,000. So I think this functionality is really cool. For those of you that know SQL, this is going to be very natural. You can take a Polar's data frame and you can very easily perform SQL queries to do a variety of different tasks against that data frame. Now we could do more complex things. For example, we could do joins on one data frame with another data frame and we can select distinct values and so on. We're not going to dive into that here, but if you're interested in the full set of functionality, there's this page here that I'll link in the description. And this page gives you an overview of all of the public SQL functions and operations that are supported by Polos. Now what I'm going to do is go back to the notebook and we're going to look at handling null values using the SQL context. So we have a grouping here for employees that don't belong to a team. So the value of the team in this group by statement is null and the salary for all of those has been aggregated and the mean is that number here. Now we saw in the last video how to filter the data frame to get back the rows with null values only as one example. So let's see how to do that using the data frame dot filter method. We're going to select that team column that we're aggregating and we can look at the is underscore null function here. And when we execute that, all of the results that come back from that statement will have null in the team column. And conversely, if we wanted to get back the results that are not null in the team column, we can use the is not null function within this filter statement. So we can map these expressions to SQL as well. So what I'm going to do is use the df.sql function and we're going to execute the query select all from self because we're using df.sql and we're going to use a where clause here. We're going to look at the team column and we only want to get back the values where team is not null. When we execute that, all of the values here in the team column are not going to be null. And conversely, if we want to get back the values that are null, we can use that statement where team is null. And you can see on the right hand side, just below here in the data frame, every single record that we've got back has null in this column. So what we're going to do is go back up to the SQL statement here. This is the group by statement here and we have a null group in the output. We want to remove that. So what we can do before we group is we can add a where clause here and we're going to look at the team column and we want to get back only the teams that are not null. Or maybe a better way to say that is that we only want to get back the rows where the team column is not null for that given row. So if we look at this statement, we're going to get the team and the average salary from the data frame. But before we take the average, we're going to filter out the rows that have a null value in the team column. And after we filter those out, we're going to group by that team column and that will no longer contain those null values. And then we have this having clause here 
And what that's going to do is it's going to take the aggregated data and it's going to remove the groupings where the average salary is not greater than 90,000. So let's execute this and we're going to look at the results. At the bottom here, we have this null value. When we now execute this, we can see that that has been removed. So we can very easily build up these kind of complex SQL statements. Nothing too complex about this. There are much more complex statements that you could write, but there's a very flexible interface that Polars provides for writing these statements and then getting back the data that you're interested in. And that could be perhaps after filtering, after adding new columns, and after grouping and aggregating the data. Now I want to finish the video by looking at the SQL context that was mentioned earlier. Now Polars provides this dedicated class for querying frame data, and this offers additional control over table registration and the management of state, and it can also be used as a context manager. Now, if we scroll down, we're going to see how this is used. Let's say we have a lazy frame here, and that's very similar to a data frame, but it uses that lazy API. What we can then do is instantiate an SQL context in Polars, and we can pass a frame to that. And the frame that we're passing is the lazy frame that's instantiated above here. And then when we have that SQL context, we can call the execute function and then execute SQL statements against the data frames that have been registered in that context. Once we execute queries, we can then call the collect method in order to actually manifest the results. And you can see below the output of this statement. We're going to do something very similar. So let's go back to the Jupyter Notebook. What I'm going to do is just go to the bottom here. And what we're going to do is create a context object here, a context variable in Python. And we're going to instantiate the SQL context object. And we're going to pass a frame called employees and set that equal to the data frame. So this is giving us that additional control over the naming here. We are referencing the data frame that we've been using and we're calling it employees by passing this keyword argument. And then what we can do is we can execute queries. So I'm going to create a variable called result and we're going to call context.execute. And I'm just going to pass that same SQL statement into that where we select the team and the average salary from the employees table and we're grouping by that team and ordering by team. So one difference here is that we are selecting from a table called employees and that's because of this keyword argument. So we're no longer referring to it as data frame or self. We can now give it a name, in this case, employees. And then to get the result, we can call the collect method and we can see the output just below. Now this might be familiar if you've used something like Spark before. We can create an SQL context and register tables in that context and then execute SQL queries against those tables. And like before, if we wanted to avoid having to call the collect method, we can pass the eager keyword argument to the SQL context and set that to true. And that is going to give us back the results immediately by executing in eager mode as opposed to lazy mode. Now, if you want to look at all of the tables that you have in the current context, you can take the context object and there's a function on that called tables. And at the moment, we only have a single table and that's the employees table that we registered up here using this keyword argument. And the final thing to note is that we can use the SQL context as a context manager in Python. So I'm going to change this statement up here and a context manager is declared using the with keyword in Python. So with pl.sql context and we're using the same keyword arguments and we're going to get back a variable here called context and we can then tab this over where we call context.execute. And we're also going to tab over the results here. Let's display these when we execute this. And you can see we get back the same table here below. And when you use the context, that allows you to register certain tables only for the statements that come within that context manager. So that gives you a bit more control over what tables are registered at a given block of code. I'll leave a link to the SQL context documentation in the description of the video, but this just provides another way of interacting with data frames in Polars using SQL. And it gives you more control over things like table names and the mode of execution for a bunch of queries that appear within the context manager. In this case, we're setting it as eager. So the SQL context provides all of that. If you're interested in more videos on this, let me know in the comments. But that's all for this video. In this video, we've taken a real life data set and we've downloaded the CSV file and read that into our application using the Polar's read CSV function. And we've then taken these kind of aggregation functions that we can write using native Polar's expressions and we've expressed these using SQL. And like I said earlier, this gives you the benefit of allowing people that might not be Python or Polos experts, the ability to query these data frames using a language that might be more familiar to them in SQL. Now I want to make more videos on Polos. It's something that I'm really liking at the moment. So if you're interested in more and you have any ideas, drop them in the comments. And again, if you want to support the channel, we have a link to our coffee page in the description. That would be amazing if you want to contribute to that. 
And otherwise, don't forget to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you in the next video.